London, January 1944. Beneath the calm surface, great plans are laid. At last, the war goes well, and all thoughts are on the impending second front. But one veteran soldier does not figure in these plans. General Andy McNaughton had resigned command of the Canadian Army and is going home. McNaughton had built this army from the first days. He was liked and respected by his men. But on the highest levels, there had been trouble. Sir Alan Brooke and the British High Command acknowledged his distinguished abilities. But they did not feel he was the man to lead this army in the field. And McNaughton had been in growing disagreement with his own government. He had wanted to keep the Canadian army together, but he had been overruled and a corps had been sent to fight in Italy. Although in public they were cordial, there was deep personal conflict between McNaughton and Canada's defense minister, Leighton Ralston. Finally, these differences with both British and Canadian authorities had become irreconcilable and McNaughton gave up the command. The McNaughton affair had been a great problem for Mackenzie King, but he was more disturbed by a second event of early 44, an event with deep international implications. When he arrived in England for a spring conference, the Canadian Prime Minister had a hard message for the other Commonwealth countries. Canada had long waited for her new status as equal partner with Britain. King thought this status was in peril, and he reacted strongly. Speaking in Toronto, Lord Halifax, one time British Foreign Secretary, now ambassador to Washington, had advocated a unified foreign policy for the Commonwealth. We begin today to look beyond the war to the reordering of the world which must follow. We see three great powers, the United States, the Russia, and China, great in numbers, areas, and natural resources. In the company of these titans, Great Britain, apart from the rest of the Commonwealth and Empire, could hardly claim equal partnership. And therefore, not Great Britain only, but the British Commonwealth and Empire must be the fourth power in that group upon which, under providence, as I see it, the peace of the world is henceforth going to depend. This was the Titan theory, and Mackenzie King made it clear that he did not subscribe. Canada would cooperate fully within the loose framework of the Commonwealth, but would retain her independent voice in international affairs. King expressed these views when he was invited to speak to the British Houses of Parliament. Uh, we have uh, known him a long time. Like uh, most of us here, he is a party politician. Well, uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of in that. Um, I call upon Mr. Mackenzie King. Our first duty is to win the war. But to win the war, we must keep the vision of a better future. We must never cease to strive for its fulfillment. No lesser vision will suffice to give the victory over those who seek world domination and human enslavement. No lesser vision will enable us fittingly to honor the memory of the men and women who are giving their all for freedom and justice. In the realization of this vision, Governments and peoples who owe a common allegiance to the crown may well find the new meaning and significance of the British Commonwealth and Empire. It is for us to make of our association a free British nation, a model of what we hope the whole world will someday become. Back home, the Prime Minister is met by his full cabinet. It's going to be a hard struggle, maybe a longer struggle than we realize at the moment, but that the outcome will be certain, there is no doubt in the world. Uh, I do not think that I should perhaps detain you at length this evening, 
But uh, may I say uh, to my fellow Canadians, I was never prouder of Canada in my life uh, than I was while in Britain. I am so glad to be back in Canada again, and I thank God for the providence that has protected us all on our journey. Canadian escorts were now running one of the roughest gauntlets of the war. They were on the Murmansk run, through the Arctic Sea to Russia. These were home waters for the wolf packs and within easy range of the Luftwaffe. If a ship sank in these waters, few survived, for a man froze to death in minutes. And many sank. One convoy had lost 23 of its 34 ships. The cost of bringing supplies to the Russians was great. But the Russians were fighting most of the German army, and the price must be paid. It was one of the few contacts of the war between Canadian fighting men and the Russians, and it was friendly. Canadians were in another odd corner of the global war. Halfway around the world was the Aleutian island of Kiska, it had been occupied by 60,000 Japanese. They had been under attack for months by American and Canadian airmen. Now, 30,000 Americans, plus a brigade of 4,800 Canadian home defense conscripts, sailed on Kiska. They expected a bloody fight. They found not a single enemy soldier. The Japanese had decided the island was untenable and 18 days before had stolen away under the Arctic fog. Early 44 on the Italian front. The winter line is cold and quiet. Canadian concert parties break the gloom. There's roses that parted their noses. There's roses that hinted their hair. Each is a lovely rose. But here is a rose that I know. She's a hard oil rose. She says these dem and a dose. She can yes you to death while you're spending your dough. But boys, if you're broke, can't that dame say no? She's a hard oil rose. Now, guys, that side spreading scatterbrain, our star and producer, Wally P. Brennan. <laughs> Wally, yes. I'll explain it so that even you will understand it. Thanks very much. Now you take this flower. Take the flower. And you waft it gently under a young lady's nose. Yeah? She falls madly in love with you. It, you mean to say one waft and you got her? That's the idea. W w will it work for me? Why, certainly it will. Give me that thing, okay. boy. I'll grab the next one. Oh, get it. Hey, slack, just a moment, please. Uh, wafty, wafty. Mm. Yippee! <laughs> Hearts are high when the band goes 